Well, this morning, as, uh, as I have the amazing privilege of sharing with you about my recent missions trip to Africa, and in a word, it was amazing. I want to frame my discussion today in light of Scripture, and you'll see that outline in your bulletins to that effect, because missions is something we all need to engage in. The great commission that Jesus gave us has that word mission in the word commission. And it's given to every person in the church, Jesus said, and came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So how do you as a believer fulfill the Great Commission? Because it has been given to every believer. How do you go, as we're told in Acts 1.8, into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth? Our Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria is here in Boise in the Treasure Valley in Idaho. But how about those remotest parts of the earth? Now here locally, you are one who must be proclaiming Christ, evangelizing in the areas that you go every day. And if it's been a month or so or longer since you've spoken the name of Jesus to someone who did not know Christ, then you're not in submission to God on this important area. And if that's the case, please come and see me. Come see one of us as elders. We'd love to help you get over this fear of man that we all have of being afraid to share Christ. And we're going to have an evangelism class soon. And if that last comment of mine stepped on your toes a little bit, please sign up for that evangelism class. We'd love to have you be there. But how do you reach the remotest parts of the earth? Well, that's exactly what we're going to focus on this morning with our title, What's Your Mission? And our theme hopefully will help achieve that with four facets of your mission in building the church. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. 1 Timothy 3 and 14. This is where our first main point comes from, which I've titled the main outcome. And it's also the focus of Paul's letter to young Timothy as he led the church in Ephesus. I've selected it because it also was the first teaching that we did to the churches both in Kenya and in Sierra Leone on this recent trip as we went through creating expository preaching, or excuse me, creating expository sermons with them. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the house of, household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Paul writes to Timothy this critical letter, and this is the theme of that letter. It is the overarching purpose for which he writes. He began in chapter 1, and he warns Timothy against false teachers. Then he moves into a section on prayer near the end of chapter 1. In chapter 2, he moves forward and switches to instruction to the church. And then near the end of chapter 2, he starts focusing on a proper role for women in the church. We have to teach on this subject, the proper role of women in the church, every time we go to Africa. Because the prosperity gospel and the Pentecostal movement has affirmed that it's okay for women to preach and teach men. And that is not biblical. And so we have to explain that to them and do it from scripture. Because if I just show up and say, you ladies, some of which are very good teachers, and I say to them, you should not be teaching men, they'll look at me and go, well, who are you? So we go to God's word and we teach them from there and we go to 1 Corinthians 14 and we teach them from there. And then in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, Paul takes us to the important qualifications of elder and then deacon, those which I've had the privilege of sharing with you from for our daily devotionals in our pastor's absence and we're so thankful the Lord has brought you back and in good form and that you're here with us. So after that, then we see this main theme verse for the book. Paul had hoped to come to Timothy in Ephesus, but in case he was delayed, he wanted him to know this because it was the most important teaching in the book. 
It contained all the information on how one is to do church. And he gives us three identifications for the church in verse 15. He says, first, it's the household of God. We are not random believers that have come together at this time, at this place, in order to worship. We are a household that God has divinely brought together as if we were born into this group. We are placed here by God. Ephesians 2.19 and Hebrews 3.6 and elsewhere in Scripture confirming this. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that as God saved us and gifted us, He specifically placed us in the local church as members of this body to do the work that He has for us here. It's interesting, the parallel with salvation. You know, as a right understanding of Reformed theology tells us, we don't lose our salvation. Because we didn't choose it. God chose us. It is all of faith. It is all of grace. It is all of Christ. It is all of the scripture and all for God's glory, which is the five pillars of the Reformation. And if that's the case, and if God so chose us that we cannot lose our salvation, and he did, and if he so placed us in the household of God that we would be part of these mem this membership, and he did, then we need to understand that it's not up to us to just decide and pick and choose when we're going to go or do something different. Many people have said over the years of my ministry, oh, I, I, I want a different youth group for my kids. Oh, I want a little different worship for my family. We want a little different style, or I want a little different preaching. If God placed you here, that's not our choice to make. It's Him who is deciding. And then he defines the church secondly as the church of the living God. We are the only assembly in the world that worships a living God. Lots of people worship lots of gods, but only one is living, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is lastly the pillar and support of the church. So if the church is the structure of the truth, and it is where truth resides and is sustained then the church is the main component in God's continued plan of redemption. And this is the graphic that we used as we taught the churches about this concept. Notice the pillar and buttress of the truth as the foundation, the proper role of pastor, elder, and bishop or overseer, that which I've been discussing in our daily devotionals. And then we talked to them about the role of the pastor, that he is shepherd, that he is an example to the flock that he is to preach the word. Because in the African context, in the prosperity gospel movement, none of this is happening. People aren't shepherding the flock of God and caring for them. They're taking the food from the sheep. They're not living as an example to the sheep. Rather, they are living as an abomination of what God's word says as they pursue finances and wealth. They're not preaching the word of God. They're preaching their own message. I could come to here and come here and tell you 40 minutes of wonderful stories about my life because I've had a really interesting life. And I could probably keep you entertained, well, at least for four or five minutes. But when you left, you would have nothing of value. So we teach them that the only thing that they can teach is the Word of God because it is the only thing that feeds the flock. And this is a, a wonderful privilege that we have in proclaiming these truths to them. It's great for us to recognize all of these different aspects as we move forward because this is the main outcome. is the main outcome of 1 Timothy and it's the main outcome of our trips to Africa as we teach these men how to preach and teach the Word of God. And this is what the outcome looks like. The, the missions group which I'm affiliated, SGM, is Spread of Grace Ministries. And it has as its mission statement to reach out to rural pastors who have little to no opportunity for training nor resources. Many of these men don't have Bibles in their own language or prior to our arrival. Can you imagine trying to teach the Bible in Swahili when you have an English Bible? And oh yeah, you can kind of read it, but do you understand it? No. So we want to make sure we get Bibles in their languages into their hands. Most of the men in the African context have uh, about a high school graduation level, some not quite as much. 
And so our goal is to teach them and to help them and to build them up. Here is the plan that's been developed to over four years to carry these men through this process of proper teaching. We start with this foundation of biblical ministry and Bible study. We go into their churches, we assemble groups of pastors in these regions, and we preach to them for five days for two different times a year about the right role of women in the church, about the right role of a pastor, about who an elder is, about the, their errant views of the sign gifts. And, and after that first week of teaching and the first week of kind of stepping on everyone's toes by telling them that what they're doing is not right, we come back again and see if there's enough that return that we have a group that we can move forward with. And that's how we decide whether this is a viable place for us to move forward in the ministry. Then we start into teaching them to study the Bible, developing Bible study skills. And then we take them into introductory aspects of preaching and then to creating expository sermons, to different aspects of preaching the gospel. In year three, into an Old Testament and New Testament survey course almost identical to what we teach you in our Old Testament and New Testament survey, which you might think is fairly simplistic. And it's not particularly deep, but this is something these men don't know. So we want them to be able to get their arms around all of Scripture. And then we dive into doctrine to help them understand more about this. In reality, we can only go two times a year, although we would like to go more and, and it, this does work well because it gives the pastors a chance to assimilate and to practice what we teach them. And this is what that plan looks like as we go to each place. This is Ron Brown from Calvary Bible Church in Haley, who is a dear, dear friend of mine and went on his first trip this year. And basically our teachings have 10 sessions in them. We break them up into three each day and then share those teaching responsibilities. This is uh, our next part where we practice. After we teach them, we break them into groups and then we help them. This is me kind of listening to what's going on with that group that I'm near. And in the uh, upper left, you see Lance kneeling down. He's now instructing these students on some of the teaching we've just given them. Here's Lance real, with the group really getting down to the particulars of how they need to understand what creating expository sermons looks like. These men, the two on the right, particularly, as you'll see later, are uh, pastors who grew up in the orphanage that we were visiting in Sierra Leone and are now pastoring other churches. So as we continue this aspect, this is the main objective. This is what we're focusing on in proclaiming the truth. But what we want to look at next is the multiplied offspring in Acts 14. If you'd turn with me to Acts 14. Because now that we've established what the mission of the church is to be the pillar and support of the truth, now we need to see the churches multiplied. And they are this multiplied offspring. And this is what we understand when we look into the books of Acts, and particularly Acts 14 and verse 1. And this is where we begin this idea of the understanding of missions. In Acts 14 and 1, it says, In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and of Greeks. Isn't that amazing? People preach God's word and men and women come to salvation. Well, of course it's amazing because it's what's happened to us. God has opened our eyes to this truth. But in verse 2, then there are those that are antagonistic. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and bittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. So the people are believing, some are antagonistic and disbelieving, but they're spending a long time. The ministry of spread of grace is not an in-and-out, short-term endeavor. We are there for the long haul to help the people of these regions learn to preach and to be a resource for them. And we do that by relying on the word of His grace because that's how people are coming to salvation. Jesus is revealing Himself. 
And notice in Acts 14, he was also granting that signs and wonders be done. The purpose of the signs and wonders in that context is so that they would understand reliance upon the Lord. And we help them see the signs and wonders movement has ceased. It is over at this time. People no longer have the gift of healing. If you are given a spiritual gift, it is for your continuous usage. If you had the gift of healing, you could go hospital room to hospital room to hospital room and heal. And men are not doing that because that gift is no longer active. God is still doing healings, but not through a spiritual gift. And we help them see and understand the right perspective of this gift. And that is so important for us to help them recognize. In the next verses, 4 to 7, they and they incur more opposition. In verse 8 of chapter 14, Paul heals a man, and they think Paul and Barnabas are gods, so they want to sacrifice to them uh, an act they barely overcome. And then in verse 19, Paul is stoned. Look down at verse 20 of Acts 14 with me. In Acts 14, 20, but while the disciples stood around him, that is Paul having been stoned, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe, and after he had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, they prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed." The men continue, they go back to these areas, they continue to reinforce the teaching that they had started and they establish a right understanding of elders and a right understanding of how the church is to function. And this is exactly the program that we seek to emulate and carry forward in spread of grace ministries to encouraging the church and to establishing elders and to recognize that even though there is opposition and there is much opposition in Africa. There's much opposition in America. The cultures are not that different from their mental perspective with respect to the church. Acts 20 is very similar. Paul's preaching the gospel against opposition. In verse 7 of Acts 20, Paul preaches from dinner to midnight. No more complaints about 50-minute sermons, about six hours on that first bit. Eutychus falls asleep. If you fall asleep, this is okay, but just don't fall out the window and die as he did. Paul raises him from the dead, and we think that would be enough. Okay, six hours, we've raised a guy from the dead. Let's have a little nap. Not Paul. He's back at it, and another six to eight hours till breakfast, he's preaching. Paul goes on again until morning. Now, we in no way approach the vigor or effectiveness of the Apostle Paul. But we teach these men for four-day sessions, for seven to eight hours a day. We provide all of the meals for them. And then after the meals are over, most of these students are coming back and they're working on their homework. These are committed followers of Christ that desire to learn this truth. And it's wonderful to see their commitment. And this is what that looks like as we try to put it to play. This is our team in Kenya. You see the Kasumu Airport behind us on the sign. Myself, Lance Fessler in the middle from uh, Pennsylvania and Ron from Calvary. Here we are teaching the group in Kenya, about 80 students here, 50 of which or so are senior pastors. Here is the picture of our post exam. Uh, 78 students took our final exam. This is the largest group we've ever had in SGM take an exam, and uh, some of them are still smiling, which is great to see. As we went on to Sierra Leone, two more men joined us. On the left, uh, we had Andy Barnes, and then we had Josh Miller from Harrisburg Bible Church. We'll talk more about them in a minute, an amazing work that they're doing here in Sierra Leone. Our students in Sierra Leone, about 50 of them, 30 or so, are senior pastors, and the gal in the front left is not Eutychus. You'll get that joke later. Um, the post, thank you, the post sermon, or the, excuse me, the post final exam picture, we had 44 students taking our final exam. And uh, it was incredible. You notice the women that are there? We do teach women. We teach them first to have a right understanding of their role in the church, teaching other women and teaching children. And then we encourage them by helping them learn how to do that. 
The gal second uh, on the left with the red hair is an absolutely brilliant student and pulled so many wonderful things out of the text. And when she shared in the, in the women only, because we separate the men from the women for their sharing, I was weeping as she was proclaiming the importance of women teaching women. In an African context, that's rarely heard. And it just shows what God is doing in the hearts of these ladies. It's fantastic to recognize that of these two groups, about 80 senior pastors representing churches of 50 to 150 people, that we are seeing as many as 8,000 people impacted by our teaching. And that would be tremendous because the ministry is having such an impact. But it's bigger than that. We're also ministering in Ethiopia, in Uganda, actually two locations in Uganda, as well as a training school that's just started there, in Congo, in Mexico. And there are requests for our ministries in Rwanda, Tanzania, in South Sudan, in Zambia, and elsewhere. There are more requests in the countries that we're in to go and to teach. The ministry impact is being seen everywhere and Tens of thousands of people are being impacted by what the Lord is doing. But it isn't about numbers. And that leads us to our third point, the manifested outgrowth. It's important that every mission have its practical outworking. That is, there must be a solid doctrinal foundation to the work. And then this doctrine must have its applied practical perspective. And this is just what the book of Ephesians is about. And this was the book that we used to teach all the lessons on creating expository sermons. We began in Ephesians 1 and walked them through the book and had them create sermons all the way along. And this way they understood how to create a sermon. They understood how the book of Ephesians was divided into two halves. The first half being doctrine, the second half being practice. And we help them in this way that when they finished the teaching, they could go back to their churches and they had worked on an entire book of scripture that they could then preach expositorily to their congregations. We began as we went through this and, and we focused heavily on Ephesians chapter 2 where we understood to begin with in verse 1 that they were dead in their sins and trespasses. This is an important understanding because many people believe that they are choosing salvation. Many people believe that they can earn their way to heaven. And in fact, every aberrant perspective on religion is a works righteousness movement. Well, when you look at Ephesians 2.1, you recognize there's not a lot of good that we can work towards. We're dead. We are sinners by wrath, sinners by nature, and we teach them and show them that. And then we take them forward to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which I earlier referenced with the foundation of, of salvation, that by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, and not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And here we establish a proper understanding of salvation, that we don't earn it, that God brings it to us, that it is all his work, and that we are sinners dead in our trespasses, and that we must repent and turn from those things and come to Christ. These are vital elements for us to teach these students and to help them see the gospel. Because just like every sermon, we never know if there are unbelievers in the room, and we must assume that there are even when we're teaching pastors. And so we do bring the gospel and help them see this. And we teach the students how to prepare these sermons through Ephesians and to understand the book such that they have a foundation in this. And this is what it looks like as we teach them the methodology of preparing sermons. We take them through these seven different steps, creating a passage summary, a purpose statement, main points, what's in those main points, explanation, illustration, and application, and aiming the purpose. And we take one section of scripture at a time and walk them through it. We begin with Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. And we talk to them about developing a passage summary. What is a passage summary? It is a one sentence statement that the original author meant to the original audience. And we help them work through and develop a one-sentence statement that Paul meant to the Ephesian church when he wrote. 
then we move on in Ephesians 1 and 15 to 21, and we help them develop a purpose statement. And what is a purpose statement? It is a one-sentence summary that the pastor wants to convey of what the pastor wants to convey to his church. And notice it comes from the purpose statement, or excuse me, from the passage summary. You don't invent what you want to preach on, just pull a text and go, which is what happens a lot of times in churches all across our country and theirs, but rather we want to preach what the text says. Then we move on to Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, and we have them develop main points. Are there two points, three points, four points? We don't tell them, we make them go through the study. And then we sit with them and we practice each of these things. We show them what are our explanations, going through word studies, looking at the different aspects of the text, an illustration and an application, what's proper, what's not. And then in the end, and believe it or not, this is how we do sermons everywhere and everyone that is focusing on God and His Word, is after we've written the sermon, we come back and do an introduction. Because we don't know what we're going to tell people Till we know what we're going to tell them. And the introduction has to introduce that. So after it's all done, we write an introduction and a conclusion and put a title to this. And this is the understanding of how we carry forth this process. And this is what we do in all of the work in these two areas. Well, you notice that I left out Ephesians 1, 1 to 2. That's because that's primarily background. Well, how do they come up with that? This is a stack of Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionaries that we took to Kenya. These are Bible dictionaries that you purchased for these people. And this is where we take them back to, and here, is a, here I am explaining to them how they can go back and look into the uh, description of the Ephesians to the church at Ephesus and get information on this background to help their people know the context that the book is written in. And it was such a blessing to be able to do this. We did this also in Sierra Leone. This is a short video clip of me uh, explaining these Bible dictionaries. Notice the response at the end, and not only my goofy look because I wasn't expecting it, but how powerful bringing these gifts to these men and women were. This book, this book here, is uh, a, a Bible dictionary. It's in a Bible dictionary. It has pictures in it. It got pictures inside. And it is a tremendous resource it's for preparing, for preaching, for and teaching. And then we will help you for preach and for teach. We will be using it later today. It's a letter I'll get for you, Sam. And because there are many of you. And because for good people are there now. So that you don't confuse your book. Let people are not mistake by the book then. When you get it, I suggest you put your name in it. Well, you got some book. The reason that they were applauding and that I was so shocked is they thought we were going to take the books back after we let them use them. So we took 140 books that you purchased to Kenya and Sierra Leone, and these were tremendous gifts. You'll hear Pastor Hassan, who's interpreting there, share some of those details. It sounds like he's just saying English to English, but it's because of our accents and also because they speak more of a Creole-type English. So some of it sounds similar, but some of it is, is very different. But at times you wonder, why are you translating what I just said? But that's okay. But thank you for that. There was no Amazon or UPS or FedEx, so we carried about 450 pounds of books um, through airports all across the world to get them there. But we're so thankful for your work in helping us do that. And after we showed them then the doctrinal part of Ephesians, we took them to the practical portion. And in Ephesians 4, we began and we showed them the text that talks about unity in the first six verses. And then explaining them the practical outworking of what happens in the church. And in Ephesians 4, it talks about, again, the spiritual gifts. And we would go over with them what that meant and what it didn't. That it was for a time for the authentication of the original apostles. But the purpose was to build up the church 
for the work of the saints, that all of the church would come to a unity of faith, that all would be raised up to this fullness of Christ. And then we carried on to talk to them about how important this kind of teaching was, that without it, we were children tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. And that if they didn't teach their churches the truth of the word of God, their people would be weak and would be prey for every wolf and every false prophet that are roaming everywhere throughout their streets as they are in ours. And it was so important that we began to talk about the outworking of these details because attacks will come to these churches as they preach the truth. In fact, Jimmy who is in Uganda, who is a dear friend of mine, was just recently, after planning a church and being there for 14 years, was charged uh, as being a false teacher because he was not allowing a woman to speak and preach in church. He actually was removed from that church uh, by that denomination and began another work as a result of that. So they need this foundation and they need this strength so that they can carry forward with what's going on. This is what we left them with as an overview of the book of Ephesians. You'll notice an overarching statement on what the church is, understanding and living our identity in Christ, key words on love and walk, uh, key phrases in, in Him, and what each of the sections of the Scripture are focusing on so that they can have a quick handle and a resource to get back to these foundational principles. And this is how we did it, one by one in evangelism and discipleship. Here's Ron working with one of the pastors after a session to talk to him about what we've worked on. And Pastor Lance doing the same, and myself along with uh, one of the translators. This was an opportunity we had on, we thought Wednesday in Kenya we were going to all get to go preach. So I prepared a message on preaching to pastors. We found out Wednesday morning that no, we don't do Wednesday evening preaching here in Kenya. We have Bible studies. Okay, so I'm scrambling all day to get a new message for a Bible study because uh, that's not going to be pastors preaching and it's the local church. So I get that all dialed in and we're walking about two miles after our Wednesday program to the study and the pastor goes, oh, by the way, this is mostly women because the men are still out in the field. And so now I'm scrambling going, okay, now what am I going to do? And he goes, you know, it'd be great if you just teach on Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. And I'm like, okay. So I've got about a two mile walk for my preparation time here. And as it turned out, all three of us taught on the same text in three different studies. And it was such a blessing. Ron got a chance to sit down. I was asked to stand up, and that was interesting in a small ladies' Bible study, but it was still wonderful. And we had the, the opportunity to go out, and uh, here's Lance, or yeah, Lance with a couple of the pastors in Sierra Leone. Myself working, this young man on the left is about 14 years old. He was one of our best students. His father was in the military and wasn't able to come to this session, but he showed up one afternoon. So I took them aside and tried to bring him up to speed on what we taught so that he wasn't missing all of the teaching. Ron working with some of the young men, and then they found this guy that, I don't know, he didn't seem to need a microphone there. <laughs> Maybe it was, had something to do with the context. I'm not sure. But uh, this is the, the manifested outgrowth, building churches. And it's such an important aspect for us. And as we understand that, we want to go to then our fourth point, the multifaceted outcome. And for this, I want to take you to James 1.27. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In our third point, we looked at how the missionaries impacted the churches. In our fourth point, we're going to look at how the churches impacted the missionaries. And hopefully this will bring to fruition the question of our title, What's Your Mission? And I hope this will be the mission and the world impacting you. These are some of the beautiful children in Kenya. And uh, most of the boys are out working with their fathers in the fields, but these girls were diligently there listening, and, and they loved the fact that I took lollipops, so that, that helped gain their attention. Tootsie Pops, actually, best of all, and uh, it was a very special time. These were the ladies in Sierra Leone preparing dinner for us. 
These people don't eat meat because they can't afford it. And here these ladies are cooking chicken for 50 people. Notice closely the kitchen quarters there. Uh, in the back right is the well, which they only had recently, the water from which would be completely unsafe for us to drink. And they know that, so they heavily boil all the food and water. And notice the, what they're cooking over. Not exactly uh, a gas range, but rather over fire. And look at the size of those pots on the left of the screen. Incredible that these ladies would step up in this way. We next visited an amputee village. Uh, this was kind of a, a heavy moment for us. Uh, the war, the civil war in Kenya, left many of the young men maimed because rather than killing them, they would just come through, the uh, attackers and the raiders would come through and just mutilate them by cutting off an arm or a leg as they went through. This is Pastor Josh with some of the boys, the new boys at the orphanage. You notice the little white spots on the corner of their mouths is an indication. These are new boys to the orphanage and it's an indication of their malnutrition. And when you see white spots on children's eyes and mouths, it's not that they have salt or that they haven't wiped their mouths. It is this indication of malnutrition. But these boys are well on their way thanks to the care that others are providing. This is one of the orphanages that Lance is at, the, actually the first one. It's now a boys' orphanage because as this ministry has been going on for years uh, and the children were growing up, there was a need to separate the boys and girls. So this is Lance with the boys. Here we have um, all of the kids welcoming us on our first night. And they all came by age groups and they sang to us to welcome us, welcome us to, come, to be with them. And it was pretty overwhelming. Here's a short video clip of what the boys are doing while the girls are doing other work. Notice what they're working with all day in the sun. They're preparing these fields to plant so that they have more things to add to their food. Pretty staggering. So as we think about all that's going on there, the story in Sierra Leone is that of civil war which began in the 90s and raged for about 14 years because of the extremely uh, affluent nature of the country. Although now their total annual income is about 500 US dollars a year, they are a country that is rich in diamonds and gold, but it's being built by all of the outsiders and the government and so they are instead extremely poor. After the Civil War was over for about four or five years, the Ebola crisis killed about 50,000. And through these processes, Mercy Ship Ministries, which goes around the world to help struggling countries, came and they actually built a hospital here in Sierra Leone where they took care of and tried to help amputees and to help them with prosthetics. They had surgical suites and operating and uh, uh, hospital rooms, quarters for the doctors and uh, place uh, food and conference rooms, and this is the facility that, uh, that some of these orphans are in now, and we'll talk more about this. I want to share with you quickly, this is Pastor Hassan, and this is an interview that Ron did for the church in Haley. I'd love to have you be introduced to this man. Well, Pastor Hassan, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you here in Sierra Leone. And uh, you are the, the leader and the founder of this orphanage. Yes, sir. As well as uh, another orphanage close yes, by. Yes, sir. And uh, I would just love for you to tell um, the, the folks at Calvary Bible Church about how, how you came to know Jesus as your Savior and what he's done in your life. Oh, would you just share that? Yes, sir. Um, I'm very pleased and thankful, Pastor Ron, for the blessing of having you as our teachers and helping with the pastors. And I grew up from a Muslim family. All my parents were Muslims. Mm. And when I was a baby, my dad had this uh, dream that I will become uh, a Muslim cleric, so I should not go to school where I will learn English. And so during my early years, I only studied the Quran. We memorized the Quran. But the Lord, uh, being kind, opened the door when we had an unrest in 1977. And the man who was teaching us the Quran 
they nearly killed him because of some tribal conflict. Mm. So he fled, wow. and then there was no teacher. So all my uh, age mates were going to school, and I would just stay home playing. And so one day, my pastor, my father's close friend, took me and enrolled me at the United Methodist Church School. Okay. And when my father came from work, he told my dad, "You, you are not helping this young man. He should go to school." And that's how mm. it started. I went to that school uh, and then moved on to secondary school. But everyone in my family was completely Muslim, mm. and I was, you know. And so in high school, I, my dad was ill out of the, when he got retired from the mines. He was working for a Swiss company uh, that was uh, exporting bauxite out of the country in the 60s and 70s, and he was retired in the 80s, 1980. And uh, I, my father was unable to pay my fees. And so the Catholic church in the village where our tribe is, where we return, the, past, the, the, the priest there said I should go to the Catholic church so they could pay, and I had wanted to go to school. So those three years, I started visiting the Catholic church, and the, I started worshiping with them. And right. so when I completed the high school, I became a school teacher because my grades were good. Okay, when you graduate, right? When you graduated from high school, yes, sir. You were made a teacher. Yes, sir. I was <laughs> teaching um, uh, a secondary school, and I was teaching history. Wow. And there, I got friend with a, an Assemblies of God pastor in the country who uh, started inviting me to his church and for Bible studies and prayer meetings. And the Lord used that to open my eyes mm. into spiritual things. Mm. And then the war broke out. The war was very graphic. Mm. And we fled the war. That it, was the Civil War here in yes, Sierra Leone? Yes, the Civil War. It started in 1991. Okay. You know, and so I found myself in the city. And I never liked city life. But I was very fearful about the killings and the maimings and all the bad things. So my family, we were here, and there was no church nearby. And so we started praying and studying the Bible, and then neighbors started coming. Hmm. And the Lord used that, and people started calling me pastor, pastor. <laughs> okay. Never in my widest imagination that I would become a pastor. Yeah. Because I was very quiet and shy. Yeah. And I never went to seminary. Hmm. And over those years, a baby was abandoned during the fighting. The baby was about six months old. And so uh, my family, we decided to take this baby. We never knew that, that was the door that the Lord was opening for an orphanage. And so right? we took this baby in and, and then more cases of abandoned so kids. She was the one that started your yes, sir, the baby was ministry. Got, yes, sir, in August. Mm. And he was, um, we named him Augustine and give him the son of Moses, that of Moses in the Bible, that okay. was, you know. And so that's how the orphanage started. We had no intention, no idea to open a church or an orphanage, but the need was desperate. And there was so much hardship and people were dying. Mm. So we decided to use our Christian faith. We prayed and shared our faith with people and, and several people will come and help, they will come some people will cook food and bring for the orphans, and some people will volunteer and come and help to take care of the kids. Right. It's such a great right. blessing. Wow. Wow. And so after all of those years, now we have a lot of grown men and women. Some of them are in ministry. Mm. And so I'm so... Who, so the people who grew up in the orphanage were yes, in sir. the ministry now today. Yes, sir. Yes, wow. sir. In fact, the headquarter church in Wellington, one of the orphans is the head pastor there. Mm -hmm. The church in McKinney, one of the orphans is the head pastor there, Pastor mm -hmm. Chris. He's here in the pastor's training. Mm -hmm. What a blessing. Yes, sir. It's How many children are in this orphanage here right now? Here in Waterloo, we have about 100 children. Is that 100 and, here? Yes, sir. In Wellington, where the orphanage actually started, we have like 47 children. Okay. The okay. orphanage started there, and 
the war had ended for about 20 years now, but the enemy came and we had Ebola and so many people lost their lives. Mm. And mm. Uh, as a result of the Ebola, we now have all of these children okay. that had no parents. And okay. And you're hosting the SGM conference. Yes, sir. The SGM conference is just a big, big blessing to us because I never went to seminary. And I know if I would be able to serve the Lord better, I need to study. Yeah. I need to be taught. I've been doing a lot of self-learning, mm -hmm. but I realize it's not enough, both for me and my, you know, the other pastors. So for several years, we've been praying so that the Lord will open such a door. Yeah. So we're so blessed that the Lord brought SGM and all of you great men of God are coming to help the body of Christ in our country. We are so thankful. Thank you so much. And we are so thankful to Calvary Church for supporting us by sending you, by being so kind and allowing you to come and serve us and teach us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Pastor Hassan. You're welcome, sir. So the location there that was the hospital was given to Pastor Hassan after the church that they were in was blowing the seams because of all the orphans that they had. And as the orphans were growing and they needed to separate the boys and girls. So now the initial location has those 50 boys and this location has 100, primarily girls in it, although some young men also that help with the ministry. Uh, Grace Bible Church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania found out about this work and uh, went to see what was going on to see how they could help because the structure was old. It was built to African standards. There was effectively no water except what they could gather in cisterns. And so they helped try to start creating uh, water systems, putting in wells, uh, adding toilets, and, um, and, and trying to upkeep the property. As they took some of the first videos back to Harrisburg, some of the physicians in the church looked at the children and saw their eyes and their mouths, and they said, these children are malnourished. And so the church said, well, we can't have that. So they stepped up to start providing food. And so now the children have two meals of rice with a protein mix over the top each day, and they've abated the malnutrition that's ongoing in the facility. They recognized with 150 kids, they needed some kind of health care. So they decided they were going to go out and get a nurse for these kids for $1,200 a year. Last year, $1,200 a year, they hired a full-time live-in nurse to come and to provide care for these children. And it's incredible to understand what the Lord is doing through this ministry and through this pastor. We stayed in this orphanage where uh, the accommodations might be a little less than some of you would be comfortable with. Um, the doors kind of close and the animals kind of stay out and none of them really bite, or at least I didn't get bit. Maybe it just wasn't tasty enough. But um, so we stayed there and it was just phenomenal to see the way that they cared for us and to live amongst uh, these young people was, was overwhelming. There's a thank you here from Pastor Hassan that I want to share with you as well because I find it quite impactful. Hello, I am uh, Reverend Hassan Mansari, the country director for SGM Sierra Leone. I'm so pleased, I'm so thankful for the great work that the Lord is doing through SGM. This week we have uh, a team of great experts in the Word of God and pastors from all over the country, from Kono and different parts of the country, Tonkolili, came here and those within Freetown, urban and rural have had the opportunity to study, to be taught, and we've learned great and mighty things that uh, is such a great blessing that will help the body of Christ because we believe these pastors will also help to impact uh, other pastors and other ministries in different parts of the country. So we are so grateful, like the resources, especially the, the Bibles, the, the Bible dictionaries. These are like nuclear weapons in the kingdom of darkness. And we are so grateful because we know the kingdom of darkness is going to suffer tremendously as a result of the pastors knowing the truth. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate all the great things. We thank uh, Pastor Lance and Pastor uh, Scott, Pastor Ron, 
and Pastor uh, Josh and Pastor Andy and everyone that has been praying for their families and the nation of America. We are so grateful for that nation being a blessing to us in Africa. We are so grateful and we we'll continue to remember your country in prayer because the Lord is using your nation to bring light you know, to the darkness that we've been through, you know, and so we are so, so thankful. God bless you so much. The resources that we took, did you hear what he called them? Nuclear weapons against the kingdom of darkness. And it is such a joy. SGM Ministries is exciting. It's biblical. It's exciting for me, and it's church-focused. And it's such a joy to see what the Lord is doing. I want to share with you a closing video that summarizes a lot of the things we've talked about and doubtlessly in better fashion. Well, here we are on our way out to the jet. Ron and I, Lance is somewhere right behind us here. We're so excited to be able to talk to these pastors about the Lord and that which is our great delight. in the preacher's heart. Right. right, they're going in this direction, and they need to go in this direction. I'm Ron Brown. I'm here with SGM to train pastors uh, to preach expositionally. Did I say I'm from Calvary Bible Church? <laughs> Calvary Bible Church is in Haley, Idaho. We are a congregation that's committed to teaching God's Word expositionally. Being connected with SGM really makes sense for us. Thank God because of uh, the training of SGM, it has uh, ushered us into expository preaching. We go deep into the scriptures. This is the material that comes directly out of your Bibles. What do you think the Lord's going to do with us today? Believe that the Lord's going to be and the power in His do His work. Sermon. And expository preaching is something that we believe uh, is critical to the life of any church. It is what God uses to uh, transform people more to the image of Christ. We want to teach you to ask the right questions. I am Reverend Hassan Mansari. I'm so thankful for the great work that the Lord is doing through SGM. Thank you, How do you participate? How do you go to the remotest parts of the earth? By getting behind ministries like this. The needs are pretty much self-evident. If you have any questions about those, please see me. There are uh, opportunities to uh, help with resources and, and we're doing so much through our church for which I'm so thankful. But I just want to thank you for the rich blessing of being your ambassador to Africa and to participate in this way through SGM. And I pray the Lord will encourage your heart as you consider what He's doing through us as we corporately come together to lift His name on high. 
Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to be a part of your kingdom work. Lord, we are overwhelmed that you would use such broken and cracked clay vessels as us for this work. Your faithfulness is amazing and your kindness towards us beyond that. Just ask that you would continue to strengthen us as we move ahead. Be glorified in our lives, Lord, and help us to see your work as we press ahead to see your, thing, your kingdom brought forward. And we give you thanks for all of this, your work. In Christ's name, amen.